In this episode, I'm interviewing blogger and TV host Nick Moore. It's Adrian with you, and I'm here with blogger and TV host Nick Moore. Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Nick, it's coming all the way to you from, it looks like sunny LA. Um, what, what's it's the, so sunny. Yeah. It's hot as hell up in here in Los Angeles. It's, I'm very, very jealous. It's freezing down here. Um, yes, yeah, it's winter for you guys. It is. It is. Is LA sunny the whole year round? Yeah, I mean, we have, like, gloomy weather, but, yeah, okay. it's, like, it's warm. I'm, I'm seriously thinking of just moving to L.A. because for content creation and then the weather, it's, like, my two things. And, Nick, um, most of the people, I was talking to someone yesterday, most of the people that I interview are multi-passionate and multi-talented, so it's very hard to pitch and hold them into, you know, a sentence introduction. So if you were going to introduce yourself, just for the people who don't know you, how would you introduce yourself? Exactly like you did. I'm a blogger and TV host. I know how to produce. I know how to write. But I mean, you have to learn how to do everything in this day and age. It's like the day of technology. You can't really just have one special skill set. You know, I'm a social media consultant. I can do everything except for edit. That's the one thing I actually cannot do. <laughs> That's okay. As long as you know your faults, you can hire someone to do those things for you. Absolutely. I, I don't think you're missing out on much fun doing the editing. I mean, I can tell you that from experience. No, definitely not. It's not for the impatient tourists, let me tell you. No, no. It's a time. It's a, you've got a painstaking process. Um, can we go back? I always like to know how the journey started, as in terms of, you know, going through school and how did you end up? I mean, I guess in L.A., being a content creator is not so out of the ordinary. But for people out of LA, or indeed people in Australia, being a content creator, if I take out my phone and do an Instagram Live or Snapchat, people will still stop and stare and ask, you know, what are you doing? So how did you become a content creator and a blogger and a host versus doing a nine to five job? I became a content creator without knowing that I was a content creator. And I think that that's usually how it happens for people. Yeah. I was always some kind of storyteller, whether it was in the theater, I grew up in the theater, writing, helping direct my theater company and producing things for them and making costumes and literally everything that you could think of I did in the theater and that was the best background I ever could ask for. Right. And as time went on, I was like, well, I've always wanted to be an actress because I grew up on the stage and in front of the camera and I thought I was going to be an actress and producer. So I went to USC thinking, okay, I'm going to go to film school and I'm going to study media as well at USC for Annenberg. And I'm going to use both of them so that I know how to market my TV shows or whatever yeah. content that I'm going to work on. This is when digital was starting to emerge. And then my grandfather, my whole life had told me, you're so crazy. Being an actress is not for you. You are meant to be the next Barbara Walters because he was foreign. That's really the only journalist and TV host that he knew. Right. So right. he said, go be Barbara Walters. I don't care what you have to do. Go be Barbara Walters. And it just so happens that my first semester at SC, I didn't really know too many people and I wanted to make friends. So I auditioned for the TV station um, over at USC called Trojan Vision. And you can audition for a plethora of shows, whether you're interested in politics, movies, TV, films, celebrities. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to audition, and if I get it, it's a sign, and if I don't, everyone can leave me alone, and I'm going to go down the path that I actually think that I'm going to go down. Got it. And the joke was on me, of course, because I, ended up, yeah, I got two corresponding Oops. jobs at the station, and then simultaneously an old boss of mine had messaged me and was, she basically came up to me and said, hey, I'm starting an online magazine, and we need a writer and field correspondent, so you'll be doing the celebrity interviews for the magazine. And I was like, well, that's three jobs I'm doing as a TV correspondent. So maybe they we're on to something here. Yeah. And then it was just kind of history after that. I was always a writer. So after college, when Tumblr was still around and still popping, I took my Tumblr with me on the road doing a film. And our van had broken down that day. The first day of filming, our van broke down. That's good luck. 
as the executive producer, I was like freaking out because we were so behind schedule. But I was like, you know what? The real me, the true me would find the funny in the situation and not let it bother me because worse things can happen. Everyone's safe. So while we're waiting for our car to get fixed, I started taking out my computer and I started writing the story of how our van broke down and I found the funny. <laughs> Yeah. And I just decided to do that the entire trip because so many things had gone wrong. And when I had come back from the trip, I took Tumblr with me to London through my cell phone. Like literally I took my cell phone with me, had the Tumblr app and started storytelling on Tumblr. And it was such a hit that when I came back, I was like, okay, I'm going to be a blogger now. Can you just hold up your cell phone again? Because you have something written on the back, which... Oh. <laughs> So, this so, is from Shop Sonics, and it says the future is female. Yeah. And there was a fortune cookie word of wisdom that I say <laughs> I was going through a hard time. And it says a thrilling time is in your immediate future. So tell, tell me more, tell us more about the importance of that to you. Because I imagine you didn't just stick that phone cover on because that's the only phone cover you could find. I was doing the research on you and you were sort of interviewed. It was a section called hashtag BAMF, so badass modern female, I think it was. Oh, yeah. Although, that was I know MF could stand for something else. So yeah. Can you just speak to the importance of what you're doing in terms of being a strong female who has an opinion, which I know for you was sort of a, a pivotal moment when your community, um, because you're Persian Jewish, if I'm correct. You are correct. Your, your community, oh God. your community didn't want you to have an opinion, much less say it. So, talk to us about what it's like doing what you're doing and being a strong, independent woman. I think it's really hard to be a strong, independent woman, even in 2017. I think we're not there yet, mm. but we're on the way for it to be the new normal. And I'm so lucky. Every close girlfriend of mine for the most part is a strong independent woman and like we can talk about the struggles and we can help each other and whether we work in entertainment or one of us is a doctor or one of us runs a PR company a marketing company we all wanted something for ourselves and I think that that speaks volumes as to where we are in 2017 but we're still making less than that we're still not being taken as seriously as men and you know what sometimes I think about it and I'm like wow, like we have such a long way to go. Even like women, women to women, like it's just, it's hard to not have jealousy in the workplace or between other women. And I think it's normal. And I probably am going to get a lot of flack for that. But I think a little jealousy is kind of normal because mm. it's not, it hasn't become the norm for us to support each other. So if we're told that it's okay and it's embedded in our brain that it's okay, don't be jealous of other women, help each other. Yeah. There's so much greatness. There's so much room at the top for us to succeed as women together. Then I think the jealousy will kind of calm down a little bit. But right now there's not that many spaces for women to be successful. So we feel like it's survival of the fittest and it's not. I see it with mm. bloggers all the time. Like we're in this digital age where you can be a blogger and support another blogger because you click on a hundred websites a day. Going to my website's not going to take from going to someone else's website. Yeah. Following me on Instagram isn't going to take from following another person on Instagram. So this notion of like we're in competition, it's BS. Mm. But I think we have a long way to go. And I think the future really is female. We're all learning to kind of adjust with the new normal in 2017. Why do you think, I mean, I completely agree with what you say. Why do you think, and I'm just thinking about this because I had someone who is similar to you in terms of being a very strong, independent woman, and she was dealing with a misogynistic situation at work, um, and her boss had chosen to take all the guys out for lunch because they had been working so hard, and he didn't take the women out, even though they'd been doing exactly the same work. Why do you think we continue to struggle with it? Do you think it's just a case of that's the way it used to be and we're gradually moving? Or do you think that people are threatened by strong, independent women? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I don't know what to do with a strong, independent woman. And I've been told to downplay my opinions and my strengths. And I mean, everything under the sun that you could possibly imagine, I've been told to downplay. And I, it's just a fact. And I genuinely think that it's because 
we're not used to it. You know, we're used to having the woman be at home while the male provides. And that is as far as the world dates back. It's the men who are the providers. They fed their families, even like cavemen time. Mm. So how are you going to adjust to giving up a little bit of power and a little bit of strength? But I think that there's so much strength in the vulnerability and, and the fact that you can let another woman kind of know her strength and support her. Mm. And that hasn't really been acknowledged yet. I think we have a little bit of time to go until men are okay with kind of giving up the reins a little bit. I'm so conservative. I think the man should be the man in a relationship. Mm. Absolutely think the man should be a man. I am a fighter and aggressive in my business when I come home to whomever I'm dating or whoever I end up marrying. I don't want to wear the pants. Feel free. Like, I take it. I don't want it. You want to make dinner reservations? I don't care where we go. Like, make the plan. But it's just a shift that we're going through, and it's going to take some time, for sure. Absolutely. I, I can, it's funny what you say about in business needing to be really, really fierce, but then coming home that you don't want to still be wearing the pants, because I don't, I don't know if you know, but I know a few couples where the woman comes home and still just out of necessity, not out of necessity, force of habit, still wears the pants. And yeah. the guy is kind of wishy-washy, you know, the metrosexual back from five yeah. or ten years. Yeah. And it, it drives a woman crazy that the man can't make a decision. So right. I think you make a really good point um, in that area. Can we talk about the um, having your, your community not wanting you to have an opinion? What, what was the story behind that? Why didn't they want you to speak your truth? I think people were scared for truth to be spoken. And I always say that the Persian Jewish community, while it's so beautiful mm. and it's a tight knit community, there are a lot of taboos that you just can't really address. And right. no one really wants to talk about it. It's kind of like a hush hush. Mm -hmm. If you don't talk about it, it goes away. And so me as a woman having an opinion was scary to people because they're not used to it. I say the Persian Jewish community is a behind like maybe a decade in regards to things, we've come a long way. And truthfully, like some people just don't know better and they immigrated differently and they assimilated differently. So as someone who wanted things for myself, people saw that as being intimidating to getting married or to men or to other women. And mm. I think it really just came down to me growing up and realizing that I'm not going to date someone who doesn't love that I love my job. Like, point blank. That is a huge part of me. I love being a storyteller. I can't imagine not having that side of me, and that makes me a human. And so people were just so scared that it was going to turn off the wrong, like, it was going to turn off people, whether it was a man or, like, a friend. And they were like, well, women are, you know, they're intimidated by that. They can't compete with that. And I was like, well, why is it a competition? My mom was the biggest supporter of other women. So to me, this whole thing was like foreign. I never understood why should I be worried about pissing somebody off? And why should I be worried about what anyone else thinks of me? And why, I just kept getting with the comments. Why were people sort of so, I mean, it sounds like they were concerned, but there must have been something else at play here. Why were they so concerned that something that might happen for you, I mean, it sounds like it was triggering something for them as well. I mean, if if doing what you do turns off, like, a husband, I mean, I get that that might be a fear for them, but why were they sort of projecting their fears onto you? I think maybe they, well, I can't speak for them, to be honest, sure. but I can definitely tell you from my experience that other women have come up to me and been like, I really wish that I could have been a like a journalist or I really wish I could have been like a singer or mm. this and that, but it just wasn't appropriate in my day and age. And like, you're so lucky. You're so lucky to which I replied, I'm not lucky no. because I had to fight for it. I worked hard. I'm not lucky. I, my parents did not want me to be an entertainer. If it was up to them, I would have been a lawyer. I would have been a very successful lawyer because I love the courtroom, but that wasn't for me, and they had no choice but to support me because I didn't give them any other choice. Yeah. And I think back then, it was a little taboo to go against what your parents wanted because our culture has such respect for our elders that you listen to them and you don't really go against 
go away from what they want for you. So I think it was a little bit of like, well, I didn't get to do it. So like, why should you? And the men were upset because they had the same feelings. I had a man come up to me and say, I like was a cameraman at, at, at NBC. And like, if I couldn't make it as a man, like you'll never make it. So don't even try. Wow. And, <laughs> I, and then I went, well, I like English is my first language. It wasn't yours. I'm so sorry. Like, your experience will not be mine. So that I can't just believe someone came up to you and said that. I thought you'd have to. That's like a piece of fiction. In front of my dad, actually. <laughs> well, well, you, I mean, you talked about some of the taboos, and I've got to say, it's same in Asian culture. You don't go against your parents. What are what are some of the other taboos or stereotypes that you've had to fight against to get where you are today? Because I imagine that there's more than one. Well, I've actually, like, I'm a very anxious person. So for me to be like, oh, no, that, like, gives me anxiety. Mm. Like, even if I was just kidding or, like, just the idea of anxiety or anything that had to do with your mental health, you weren't really allowed to talk about it. It wasn't nice. People think there was something wrong with you. I, like, once sprained my ankle and I had to go to a wedding. And so I had to wrap my foot, obviously, and like a little bandage and like I was told like take off the bandage and just like and wear heels and keep going by somebody at a party like that's not appropriate and I was like why I'm injured and they were like well we don't want people to think that there's something wrong with you because you got hurt or because like whatever you're wearing a cast like what if someone thinks that you're like you know, god forbid and there's something wrong with this but what if someone thinks that you're disabled and I was like First off, even if I was disabled, what is that to you? Yeah. And secondly, like, there's nothing wrong with me. I sprained my ankle. I fell down the stairs. I'm clumsy. Anyone who knows me knows that I fall over myself all the time. Like, <laughs> this is news. It sounds like it, it's a healthy dose of worrying about other people's opinions. It, it is what just it want is. I want to think that you have this, like, great life. And it's true. A lot of us have great lives, but... You know, it's not, it's all that glitters is not gold. No. It really isn't. And anytime you talk about it with other people, people are like, oh, the same thing happened to me. I went through this. Or like, I'm feeling this way. Or I'm stressed out about my career, my finances, my this, my that. Mm. I don't know if I should pursue my dreams. When you have real conversations with real people within the community, you realize everyone's going through the same thing. No one just talks about it. It's like, you're not supposed to talk about your therapist. You're not supposed to say whether you're on birth control, which like everyone's on birth control, whether it's for sexual protection or mm. if it's for regulation of their hormones. Mm. I don't really know some people who aren't on birth control, but God forbid another person, two women have a conversation about birth control and someone overhears it and automatically thinks you're a slut for having sex. It's crazy. Do you, I mean, you're obviously, you have an opinion, and you're willing to speak it, but you were told not to have it. Did you ever try to fit in, in the beginning, or when people told you to basically keep quiet, did you try it their way for a bit, and then find out that it just didn't work for you? I think that it's a fine line to speak your opinion. Yeah. I don't think everyone needs to know that you have an opinion 24 seven, and sure. honestly, sometimes I don't have an opinion about certain things, but, in the beginning, when I first started blogging, mm. I like really didn't know how much is too much and what's going to be okay with my family and what's going to make them embarrassed. And yeah. you know, you worry about that because you have respect for your parents. You don't want to make their lives harder. You Absolutely. chose them, like, they didn't, you know, and they have to hear the backlash if anything happens. So I definitely, for the first two years of GiveMeMore.com, I really had to watch myself. I would talk about a little bit of taboo. But I would like reel it back and I would try and like, you know, be a little bit political, but you can't be PC. You can't be politically correct when you're a blogger or a TV host anymore. So as time went on, I realized I needed to live my truth. And if there was a story that I had to tell that I knew could make a difference or spark something in somebody, then yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm sure people didn't like the fact that I was like, oh, well, guys, I'm going to reveal my weight on GiveMeMora.com for Love Your Body Mora. But I did it because I knew that if I had to feel this way about my weight, there were 10 other girls who felt the same way. And why should I make them feel alone if I'm going through the same thing? Mm, 
Absolutely. Was there any fear when you decided that you had to speak your truth? I imagine there must have been. There was a lot of fear when I had to speak my truth and decided that I needed to do that. I think I, I sat with my post called My Community Told Me Not to Have an Opinion for like three months. Right. Three months, I think. Like, yeah, I'm like thinking about it in my head. So I'm like gazing off trying to look at the timeline. But yeah, it was three months that I wrote that post until I clicked public. I was going to say, yeah, that, that thing, three months. Wow. Yeah, so it was it it was hard for me, and you know I got a lot of backlash. I got a lot of support for the ten amazing messages I'd get. I'd get like two bad ones, and I love haters. Haters in the building, like come forward because you're taking time out of your day to hate on me, which means <coughs> I do something to spark something in you. So if you're gonna take time out of your day to write me a mean email or write me a mean comment or start a fight on my Facebook thread, which happened. I welcome it. Come forward. Like that is why I do that. That's why I write to for people to share their own opinions and not be afraid of what they think. Like you're allowed to think what you want to think. You're entitled to your own opinion, but mm. so am mm. I. Absolutely. And I'm not going to judge you for your opinion. That's your own story. That's your own truth. As long as you don't judge me for mine either. Let, let's talk about your blog. Um, I saw somewhere that I don't know if it's a short bio, but it said somewhere peace, love, and French fries. Where, where is that? And I, I love it. And then you did a piece, an article, like a review on who's got the best French fries. Oh, which, I love French fries. Which I will tell you that a lot of those food chains we don't have in Australia. So, for example, In N Out. I, I don't know what In N Out is. I've heard of it on, a, on American. I don't know what In N Out is. Um, well, I think you need to get to. Or Jack in the Box. Uh oh. You don't have Jack in the Box either? No, we have McDonald's, <laughs> um, Burger you King. So, tell us, what, let's just talk about French fries for a sec. Okay. What let's is the, talk about French fries. What is the fascination with French fries? And I guess branching off from that, what, what's the theme at your blog? Because I've heard the word, you've used the word millennials more than once, and it seems to be equal doses of, well, it's fun, first off. Fun, fashion, yep. lifestyle. So, talk, talk to us about French fries, and then let's talk more about your blog in general. Okay. Well, on the topic of French fries, French fries is my favorite, like favorite French fries. Um, favorite. <laughs> Hashtag favorite. Um, French fries is my favorite food. Like ever since I was a little kid, French fries and chicken nuggets were like my go-to comfort meal. And it started with the same grandpa who told me to start being a TV host. But it was our kind of like our little activity together. We'd go to McDonald's after the park or when I would hang out with my grandpa. Right. So I became a French fry lover because he was a French fry lover. And we were best, sorry, that's my email going off in the background. That's fine. Um, and so we were best friends. And that is how we bond the Persian community over food. Oh, <laughs> that sounds good for your waistline. But I, I read another article of yours that, because you went to Gordon Ramsay's restaurant, and I am a huge Gordon Ramsay fan. Are you? You said you don't like salt. So if you don't like salt, how do you like French fries and nuggets? Like, I'm confused. Okay. So here's the thing with salt. At the time that I went to Gordon Ramsay's restaurant, I had to eliminate a lot of salt from my diet because I was on a very strict no gluten, no sugar, no dairy diet, and I would make my own food most of the time, and I wouldn't want to cook with salt because I was going to be bloated for camera. Yeah. So I, when you stop cooking with salt, you grow an aversion to yeah. salt. Even if the food isn't salty, if they put a little bit of salt, you're like overwhelmed with salt. Right. And I think I've always been like a salty food lover versus a sweet food lover. I don't like I mean, I only eat Cadbury's from England as chocolate, but like, I don't <laughs> love, I don't love like Hershey's chocolate or whatever. I'm more yeah. of a chips, French fries, nuggets, nachos type of person and yeah. comfort food. So when I went to Gordon Ramsay's restaurant, the food, <laughs> the food was so salty that I felt like I was spooning salt in my mouth. And that's why I said I don't like salt because it was like overwhelming for me at the time to eat that. Okay, because it was slightly confusing. I was just thinking fries and salt because unless your fries are very different because in Australia they're quite salty. So you said McDonald's has the best French fries? Yes. 
For sure, and, McDonald's and, has the best French fries. And and who were the other ones? It was McDonald's, Jack in the Box, curly fries. Okay. But that was number three. So in order, we'll go in order. So it was McDonald's, number one, animal style fries from um, In and Out. And for those of you who don't know what In and Out is, it's a burger restaurant, like it's a fast food chain, not a restaurant that is on the west coast of America. So right. that's like California, Nevada. And they have only a very limited menu. You can get like a milkshake, chocolate, vanilla, maybe strawberry. I don't know. I don't drink milkshakes. And you can get fries or you can get animal style fries, which is their potato, which is their potato fries with a layer of cheese on it, like oh. cheese fries, grilled onions, there's special sauce and chopped chili. Oh God. No, it's amazing. It's amazing. And you can get their burgers, protein style, which is lettuce wrapped, or you can get them, um, you can get grilled cheese, but they don't serve chicken, no fish. It's just like, right. it's a simple menu. And so that was my number two choice. And then my number three was Jack in the Box curly fries, because they have the best curly fries. Are uh, curly fries literally, I know this would be like hor hor horrifying to you. I don't know what curly fries are. Are they literally just fries that are curly? They're the, the curly seasoned fries. Never you had don't one. have to. You have a uh, lot to learn about French fries. I've, I've never had one. They make it in <laughs> Australia, but yeah, no, I've never had one. Okay, well, I really don't want to go to Australia now that you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> We have a lot of other things, like lovely beaches and stuff, but junk food, no, we won't be able to compete with the States, that, that's for sure. Yeah, but that's probably why everyone there has a great body. It, yeah, it, 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 although we're, we're following, but we're about, I mean, you talked about being a decade behind in the community. Australia is about a decade behind, Ameri um, uh, five years behind America in terms of pop culture and, and all the other bits and pieces. So we follow suit. So, you know, the problem that you guys are having with a lot of people being overweight, we... Right. Um, We've actually outpaced you now. We have a higher percentage of people who are overweight now than America. So we took the number one spot from you. Um, oh. I'm not going to celebrate that because that's obviously not something that you want to no, celebrate. No. But, you know, we watch, we watch all the American TV and we just happen to be a little bit behind you. So, well, if it makes you feel better, I think Australian fashion is, like, way better. Really? Okay. Yeah. If, if you say so, that, that's high praise coming from someone who, who's in L.A., yeah, but you have like so many fashion companies in Los Angeles, like Sabo Skur and like, I mean, a million that I follow on Instagram and it's crazy. Like the stuff that you have, the quality is better, the prices are better and they're honestly cuter. Like it's very right. California style and I, and I love it because we're both, I mean, I'm from Los Angeles, so it's a beach city yeah. and you guys are beachy. So it makes sense, but yeah, that sucks about the... The curly fries? <laughs> no, no, that's really sad. And I think you have so much access to information about health now that there's no reason why anybody should be not healthy. And I'm not saying skinny because that's different. You can be like not healthy and skinny, but healthy. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it's so much about convenience now. You know, everyone is time poor. So, you know, rather than making food, as you said, making your own food, it's just whatever's convenient. And, you know, these days it's, it's going to be junk food. Um, but let, let's talk more about your blog. So what, what else is, is on your blog and what's a typical day? Cause this is why I wanted to interview you because it's at least people in Australia, they know what a blogger is, but for most people here, the idea that you could actually make a living off being a blogger is completely foreign. Like they would have no idea that that was possible or how to do it. So what, what's a typical day in the life of, of a blogger and, you know, how do you go about creating it as a business rather than just a hobby? Right. So it has to start as a hobby. If you want to be a blogger, it definitely has to start as a hobby because you're not going to make money for a very long time. So mm. I've been blogging for about three and a half years. My blog is just now like profitable and not to the point where like I can only be a blogger. I have to do sponsored posts on Instagram. I have to be a TV host. I have to social media consult mm. with other companies and help them grow their business and their following and their content. So it's not enough. Even at three and a half years, it's just a supplemental income. For yep. you. Supplemental, okay. supp supplemental income started as hobby. I mean, three and a half years in the blog space, that's like 5,000 years, right? I mean, that's a long time. 
it's a lot, but you don't have to blog every day. And I think when I was going over the demographics of my blog, it was, okay, what's my audience now? Because just because I'm writing for a female audience doesn't mean that that's what's reading my blog. Hmm. And when I was like, okay, my blog, at the time my blog was pink and it was super like blog format. And it was so cute and like bloggy that it wasn't for a business. And I was like, I just want to know who's reading what. And I had a lot of male viewers and like readers. Mm. And I was really confused because I'm like, I cater to women and my blog is pink. I think I had like 45% male and 55% female. Yeah, okay. I thought it was going to be like 80% female and yeah. 20% male. So I had to start to incorporate things for the guy. and. That was really fun for me. And when we did the blog revamp, which is the beautiful layout that you see now mm. done by our manager, Sally, I wanted something a little less girly, but with still true to me and something chic and sexy and clean. And then I was able to better make content for my viewers and my audience in that sense. And I could cater to them. And now I have something for everyone. It's really a one-stop blog. We don't update it every day. I don't have time. My contributors don't have time. Sure. We have a bachelor podcast called 25 to Life that my friend Taylor and Adam in San Francisco do. And they, every season, without fail, they are on gimmemore.com. They are amazing. I have guest bloggers. I have started to write, now that I'm doing this more full-time, mm -hmm. I've started to write a lot more and a lot of, like heartfelt pieces and meaningful pieces to me. But of course, like if you want to know what to do in Los Angeles, you can also come to my blog too. How to throw a fun Instagram party, theme party, like you can do that too with Dr. Pepper. And then you start getting sponsorships and teaming up with various brands. Right. But like it's not enough to just do your own blog. You have to guest blog for other people also. So I just did something on called the problem with dating blog. And I wrote about the social media breakup and how you navigate when your significant other, your ex-significant other, just decides to I, ghost you I, and follow you. I've been through that, by the way. I was reading that again just before we got on the line. I'm going, yep, that happened to me. Did it? Yeah, and exactly like you, it, it, I don't like saying fault, but it was her decision to break up. And then she said, I'm going to be there for you no matter what. You know, We'll still be friends. And then when I moved on, which was after she had moved on, by the way, she saw yeah. that I had moved on, then she unfriended me. I'm like, you, you, <laughs> I you wanted to say what I was thinking. But like, Come on. I mean, really? Yeah. So it was something that I felt like a lot of people had gone through, and it had for the first time ever happened to me, and I was devastated. I mean, I was, like, so upset about it. I was like, I don't understand. Like, let's at least have a conversation about it. Like, we're adults, and, you know, I'm not 18 anymore. Hmm. Like, that's something I would have done at 18. I don't need to do that, but you know, different strokes, different folks. So Bruna, the girl who runs problem with dating actually ended up writing for my blog about how, being an immigrant and like life as an immigrant, how she was pursuing her dreams. And she had also just quit her job, day job and wanted to write for me. So I said, okay, if you write for me, I'm going to write something really meaningful and deep for you. Sure. And so she had written for me and then this had all happened to me and I was like, you know what, I'm going to write about the social media breakup because how do you navigate that? Like, we're in a new age where before everything was out of sight, out of mind. Like, you didn't have to see the person anymore. You don't know what they're doing anymore. Mm. And I think that that way was better. I think the past to get over someone, it was better without social media. It's probably not going to go back that way anyways, anytime soon. So, I mean, no. you must be on, I mean, with the blogging, it sounds like a, a lot of it is you got to make connections and you got to hustle and, you know, you contribute to someone and they contribute to you. And with a bit of luck and a lot of hard work, you'll begin to make a business out of it. But obviously yeah. you have to be patient. Um, with social media, I, I imagine you must be on social media all the time. So how do you balance or integrate the social media and being able to switch off? I mean, do you ever switch off? I do switch off from social media, contrary to popular belief. I actually don't post as much as other bloggers and Instagram influencers because one, I really don't think you care that much. I really don't think you care to see a photo of me every single day or six days a week or five days a week. I'm not Kim Kardashian. Like 
I'm just not famous for you to care for me to do that. Mm. So yeah, it's harder to grow your following that way, but I feel like it makes more of a point when I actually do post. For sure. And I don't Instagram story or Snap story every single day or what I'm doing all the time. I try and keep it mostly work related unless I'm with my friends and I want to show like a personal moment within my friends and give you like a little bit of a glimpse into my life. But I really, really try to disconnect Mm. from social media when I am with my friends or at a wedding or at a party or if I'm on a date with somebody else, like I'm not going to check my phone. Like my phone is in my bag. Yeah. So I think it's really important to learn how to disconnect even if you are social media. I am on social media all day long during the business day. Yeah. I am on it 24-7. But when I am out with my friends, I am out with my friends. I don't really care what's on Twitter. I don't care what's on Instagram. And I don't care what's on Snapchat. If I feel the need to post, I'll post. But I try to keep things more work-related or like French fry-related. I always get <laughs> French fries or what I'm eating. That is what I'll use like Insta Story or Snap Story for. Sure. I, I love the fact that even though your career is based so much on social media that you can actually switch off because I don't know what it's like in LA. I imagine it must be worse. But over here, you, get, you see get people getting run over because they're crossing the road whilst on their phone and they're just not looking yeah. at what's happening. And you see you know, two friends who are supposed, or a husband and wife and they're having dinner, but they're not talking to each other because they're on their phones. And I, I just find that you know, the old school romantic in me dies a little bit inside. I saw a husband and wife at dinner literally holding hands, like literally like this. And then the other, their other hand was like this, like looking at their phone. And I was like so freaked out by the fact that they were holding hands, but they were checking their phone. Like that is the future, people. That is the future. God, I think it might be time to move to another planet then. Um, that, that's... <laughs> I guess at least they were holding hands um, on, on, on the positive side. So let me ask you, let me ask you, it might be a difficult question to answer it, about the future, sort of in a year or two years, five years, ten years, where, where do you see yourself going? Because social media and blogging is, it's obviously an uncertain world. You can't take anything for granted in general, but particularly social media, you can be here one day, gone the next. So ideally for you, where do you see yourself in a year or five years or ten years down the track? Well, I mean, I hope in a year I have a continuous TV hosting job. Since right now I'm freelancing for various networks. And I mean, ideally I would be on a show within the next, within the next year, whether it's on a digital platform or broadcast, it doesn't really matter to me. I actually prefer digital because I think that that's what's ultimately going to stay with us is our computers and not really our TVs. We'll have TV screens, but it'll be digital. Um, and you'll be watching Netflix. So I would ultimately like to be doing that. My blog would be even bigger and better. And just, I want to be happy. You know, if it's not making me happy anymore, I'm not going to do it right now. My job makes me so happy and it makes me so stressed out because you have to make a living. Yeah. And you don't want your dad to buy you your career. So this is really, if I fail, it's on me. And that's really scary. So hopefully in a year I will not have failed. Sure. And, <laughs> and in five years, I hope to be married and like with starting a family or having my first kid already and um, having a nice little empire started, you know, and being like Jay-Z and Beyonce. <laughs> Have you got your sights set all the way at the top? I love it. You have to dream big and put it in the universe. Can you sing? I can hold the tune. Okay. We'll all do right. that for another time, though. Yeah, I, I, I won't ask you to demonstrate now. Um, so, it, Nick, if people want to check out, just with the social media links, what are the best ways to, to catch up with you? You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Nick, N-I-C-M-O-R-A-X-O. That's Instagram and Twitter, Nick Mora XO. And then Facebook, it's Give Me Mora. So Facebook slash Give Me Mora. You can check out my blog, which is GiveMeMora.com. You can catch us on YouTube now for the participation trophy, which we just began and going through some trials and tribulations. But be sure to subscribe because I'm going to be building my YouTube channel mm-hmm. with a panel show with one minute rants and just it'll be your an extension of Give Me Mora, the blog. 
And you can follow me on Snapchat just at Nick Mora. Fantastic. I'll put all the links below. The, the participation trophy, I was watching, uh, I think it was on Instagram, and you had an Oprah moment. You were giving everyone trophies. Yes! I love Oprah. You do quite a good Oprah impersonation. You, know, you Thank get a trophy, you, you get a trophy. I, I love Thank that. Thank you. I want it to be the Oprah of trophies. <laughs> Again, setting your sights, you know, all the way at the top. Yes. Okay, let's, um, we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, we always wrap up with the same 10 questions. So let's have some fun here. So number okay. one, what is your favorite word? Oh God, it's the F word. <laughs> Can I cuss? Of course, I wasn't quite so sure whether you were going to say fuck or fries. I... <laughs> oh wait, that's so good. I know, when you said F word, I'm like, okay. Actually, now I know. Now I can see why you're such good friends with Kirby because. Yeah. <laughs> She eventually said that was her favorite word as well. Okay. It is the most unladylike thing about me. And I'm tr like, I really make an effort not to say the word. F but sometimes it just really like it adds that zing to your to whatever you need to say. So it's f not fries. What about what's your well, least favorite to close second. What's your least favorite word? Okay, this is my least favorite word and I hate saying it and I only ever use it if I like really, really don't like someone or if they did something like really, 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 really bad. I never use it. Okay. It's <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. I hate that word. I think it's the grossest word in the dictionary. So I'm going to go with that being my least favorite word. You're the second person I've interviewed who has used that word, or they use it for an answer for another question, which we'll get to. All right. So what, uh, what sound or noise do you love? The ocean. Ah, okay. That makes sense. What about what sound or noise do you hate? Oh, my God. Nails on a freaking chalkboard. Or, or, or that, like, noise with the balloons. Like oh, that, the like, squeaky oh, noise? Oh my god, that's the worst noise of all time. I mean, oh, it makes me antsy. I, I, I know that the nails on the chalkboard thing, but I have to think, when's the last time you were in a classroom that actually had a chalkboard though? So, because they seem to be, like, aren't they a thing of the past? I don't know, yeah. That's I true. Actually, have you so actually... I'll just like the balloon noise, because I hear that a lot more, and it makes me like, oh my god. Oh. <laughs> I, can, I can see that. All right. What about what turns you on? Humor. I love a man that is just sassy and witty and can banter back and forth and just make me laugh. I think that like that's the sexiest thing in the world. All I want to do is laugh all day long. That that's a day well spent. A day spent laughing is a day well spent. I don't care if you take me on a date to a park and we go on the swings and we just die. Like I don't need to do anything crazy. Right. I just want to laugh. Like I want to sit and laugh until we can't breathe. And have some French fries as well. And French fries. Obviously, that's part of the day. Like that's not a date unless you take me for French fries. <laughs> Let's just be real. A non-negotiable. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what about what turns you off? Oh God. Oh, a lot of stuff, yo. <laughs> Where's my checklist? Well, what's the right top one, two, or three things that turn you off? Um, someone who can't fight for what they want in any aspect of their life. Not necessarily for me, but if you, like, let's say you really want to be a, like, have a restaurant. Mm. And you don't, like, you don't have the drive to do it. You can't fight for what you want. I don't want to be with you because I've had to fight for my whole life. Yeah. And I think that that's gross. Not, like, that's just some people, like, you just don't have the drive, you can't fight for what you want, you can't stand up for yourself, that's chill, but you're just not for me. Um, what else? Oh, I can't deal with the mama's boy. Can't do it. No, no, no. Anytime anyone wants to tell me that they put their mom number one, I've got to go. Like, G, 2G, too many bad experiences, can't do it. Okay. okay. And, some <laughs> and someone who lies. Sure. Okay. Yeah, All right. okay. Are there a lot of mama's boys in LA? Yeah. Oh, I, I wouldn't have thought that. I mean, I've seen like a lot of Jewish humor on sitcoms. They say that, you know, Jewish boys are, are often mama's boys, but I would have thought LA. Well, though. their stereotypes come from something. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say. Okay. 
So the seventh question, and you kind of answered it twice already, but seventh question is, what is your favorite curse word? Oh, yeah, it'd be fuck. Okay, <laughs> I was going to say, you've answered it already twice, like one with the F word, one with the C word. Okay, what about what job other than your own would you most like to attempt? Um, that's kind of hard. I mean, I would love to have a one-hit wonder. Like, I would love to be a singer with a one-hit single. What sort of style single are we talking about? Are we talking ballad? Are we talking, like, hip-hop, pop, R&B, rap? I'm more like a hip-hop, R&B type of, like, soulful, something that's just, like, like a breakup album. Like, not, maybe not a one-hit wonder, but, like, maybe, like, a one-hit album. Like, just, like, a breakup album that you just, like... <laughs> For every girl, like the stages of the breakup, like you're upset, you're crying, you're confused, and then like all of a sudden you get your freaking groove back, and you're like, oh wait, I am the best. Like, what's wrong with you? I I would be willing to bet you could come up with some titles for those songs really, really easily. Even if you can't oh, sing the songs, I bet you can come up with some really killer titles for the songs on that track, the breakup album. What about what job other than your own would you definitely not like to attempt? I would never be a doctor, because, ever. Because the blood, or? Because I just, one, my brain doesn't work that way. Like, I don't have a logical brain. I'm just a creative brain, true and true. So, like, even if I attempted to, I would fail miserably. Like, I could not do math, can't do science, can't do anything like that. So, I would never want to be a doctor. I hate blood. Someone else's life in my hands. Yeah. No, thank you. Absolutely not. Sure. That makes perfect sense. Okay. Last question, if God exists, what would you like to hear him or her say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Jeez, that's really, really, really... <laughs> I thought you were going to be like, what is God going to say? Like, what would you like to hear God say right now? I had, like, my answer ready. When you've lived but your life I... and you've had your yeah. french fries, you've had your family and you've had a massive blog and your, your one-hit album <laughs> and you arrive at the pearly gates, what do you want to hear God say? You lived your life as full and with as much laughter as you possibly could, and you made a difference in the lives of so many people. That's lovely. Just in That's so like, touching of me for the interview. I just want to, on the subject of laughter, can you remember the time that you laughed hardest, longest, and loudest? Can you, is there a singular time that you can just remember that you couldn't speak? No, because I feel like that happens to me on the daily. Like, oh, really? I'm, I'm so jealous. So, I'm, I'm so lucky. Like, I don't, I always try to find the funny in every single thing that happens to me because I have had a very difficult life full of ups and downs and mm. it's not been easy. But if I wasn't able to laugh, yeah. then yeah. like, it, there, what is the point of this? Like, what is this point of life if you don't find a little bit of humor even in the worst situation? So I'm so lucky my friends who know me know that when I'm going through a hard time, I have to make a joke and, like, we have to laugh until we die because... <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, like, I truly, like, I was, I had a really, really bad day yesterday and I was, like, crying from the day, from the second that I, like, pulled into my office to like the second that I came home to go to bed. So wow. I was on the phone with somebody because I had just a hard day and work was tough and people were mean, you know? And I pulled, called one of my friends and I was like, just make me laugh. Like, let's just like talk about something funny for one second. And then we ended up laughing for like, you know, 20 minutes, just like about yeah. our, how, yeah. whatever joke, things that happened to us, like the funny in it. And then it puts you in a better mood and you're over it, really. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds, sounds like a good day <laughs> to me. Well, it turned from a bad day into a good day. Well, Nick, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. I will put all the social media links below. I want to thank everyone for watching, and we'll speak to you next time. Thanks, Bye -bye. guys.